Hey, it's Dean DiMarzo here on Longest Solo Ever, and this is a video on recording metal guitar. Getting an aggressive, in-your-face sound that still fits in the mix can be really difficult, so here are a few tips for getting a great sound when recording metal guitar. First up is the gear we'll be using, and the first step in our signal chain is the guitar. Choosing the right guitar to record with is essential. There's a reason you don't see many ES-335s on stage with Periphery. The guitar you choose to record with is going to be one of the biggest factors in shaping your sound. First up, you absolutely want to use a solid body electric guitar. Hollow body and semi-hollow body guitars are just going to be too mellow sounding for the tones we're going for. Plus, at the kind of volume and gain levels we'll be working with, they're really prone to feedback. It's also best to use a guitar with humbucking pickups. That's these dual coil guys here, uh, instead of these single coils you'd see in strats and tellies, that kind of thing. The first reason is humbuckers are, as their name suggests, a lot less sensitive to hum and noise from electrical sources around the guitar. Single coil pickups can get a little bit noisy when you bring in the kind of distortion we're going to be using to record metal guitar. Also, their tone can be a bit too bright for the sound we're going for. Humbuckers provide a nice mid-range tone that'll sit right in the mix where we want it to. Next up are your strings. For one, new or relatively new strings are going to be best. If it's been a couple of weeks or months or years since you've last changed your strings, you might want to replace those before we start recording. As for the type of strings, the heavier you can go, the better. Heavier strings are going to have a fuller tone and hold their intonation better. So if we're playing any kind of down-tuned music or playing low chugged chords, it's not uh, gonna bend up half a step before it settles on the note we're playing and the overall mix will sound a lot cleaner. Go with the heaviest strings you can stand to play while still being able to play your songs comfortably. For a personal recommendation, I play Ernie Ball Cobalts on my seven string Carvin, which is my main guitar. Finally, and this should go without saying, but tune your guitar and retune your guitar as you record. It may seem a little obvious, but as you do take after take after take, uh, your guitar can start to drift slightly out of tune. And before you know it, that perfect take has the D string just a little bit flat. Uh, you might say, ah, it's fine, it's not that bad, but that note will haunt you for the rest of your life every time you hear that recording. So tune your guitar. So there are two major schools of thought when it comes to getting your guitar sound from this to this. The old school method is to plug your guitar into an amp or a pedal board and then an amp, stick a mic in front of it and you're good to go. A lot of newer metal production uses an alternative, amp simulators, either in plug-in form in uh, the DAW or in rack-mounted form, hardware like the Line 6 Pod and the Fractal Axe FX, both really popular with a lot of modern metal bands. Both of these are perfectly valid options, neither one is more correct or proper than the other. Uh, whichever one you choose is up to what kind of workflow you want to have, what kind of music you're producing, and what kind of space you have to work with. First up is recording with a live amp. Now first we have to think about the type of gear we're going to use. As far as an amp head goes, you're going to want something with a good amount of gain to get the kind of distortion we're looking for. If you don't have an amp head with a lot of gain, you can get a pedal involved. Uh, second, we want it to be relatively bright, but not too bright. You can pull up some records that you really love the guitar tone on and do your best to match that with the gear you have. As always, use your ears and your best judgment. I also want to briefly mention some of the best advice I ever heard as far as guitar tones go. Uh, it was from the late guitarist of ACDC, Malcolm Young. And uh, I can't find the interview now, but I remember him saying that if you go back and listen to any ACD record for the most part, especially the older ones, even the hardest, heaviest hitting riffs, he actually has a really clean guitar tone. Uh, when you turn the distortion up too high, you can lose a lot of the transients, a lot of the, uh, the real pick attack, especially in any kind of syncopated heavy riff like gent music, and that can take away from the impact of those hits, even though it seems like it's the, the metal thing to do, turn up the distortion. Keep your gain as low as you can go while still getting the tone you're looking for. Next, we'll talk microphones. There are two major categories of microphones we'll be using. The first is the dynamic microphone, uh, here represented by the SM57, although other great options include uh, Sennheiser's 609 and MD421. 
Dynamic mics use a heavy coil to pick up the sound. It moves back and forth through a magnetic field and converts that into voltage, which goes to your preamp. Now, because of that heavy duty design, they're a lot more mid range heavy and a lot less sensitive to transients. That's going to be really nice for recording metal guitars. It's going to give us the nice mid range tone we're looking for, and we can really hit it without worrying about the sound being too dynamic. That's kind of ironic given the name now that I think about it. On the condenser side of things, we'll be using an AKG C414. Uh, it's a really nice mid range condenser mic, usually used for vocals, acoustic guitars, and we'll be throwing it on an amplifier here. Now, condenser microphones use a small diaphragm instead of a big, heavy moving coil. Because of that, they can be a lot brighter, uh, a lot more sensitive to transients. And this will kind of fill in some of the blanks that the 57 might leave out. Uh, we can mix the two of these to build exactly the tone we're looking for. Next, we'll talk mic placement. If you're working with a cabinet with multiple speakers on it, unlike this 1x12 here, you're going to want to listen closely to each of the speakers in your cabinet and find the one that you think is going to suit your song the best. Next, we're going to talk about positioning the mic on the speaker. There's no right or wrong answer here. Uh, you can get a lot of different sounds depending on where exactly you place the mic. Uh, so here's a few guidelines that'll help out. First up is the location on the speaker itself. If you place the mic dead center in the middle of the speaker, you're going to get the brightest and most present sound. As you move towards the edge of the speaker, the sound will get darker and a little bit more mid-range heavy. Uh, now, the brightest and most present sound might not fit every mix, so feel free to move around, find something that works for you. Moving the mic toward and away from the speaker has a sort of similar effect, although as you move away from the speaker, you'll begin to mix in some of the noise from the sound bouncing around the room, which can be a good or a bad thing depending on the sound you're looking for. And finally, we can rotate the mic. Uh, having the microphone on axis pointed directly at the speaker will again give you the brightest and most direct tone. Turning the microphone just a little bit can start to darken up the tone again, also mixing in just the slightest bit of the room noise. get a lot of options here as the sound hits the microphone capsule in so many different ways depending on how you place it. So take some time, place the microphone uh, in a few different spots, maybe record some choices, listen back to them later, and see what you like best. It can seem really intimidating having all these options in play, you know, between the choice of the head, the choice of the cab, uh, which speaker you're using, how the microphone's pointed at the speaker, what mic you're using. You could spend hours alone debating if the 30 degree angle sounded better than the 45 degree angle. The truth is most of your sound is gotten in the first couple minutes of setting up the mics. Anything after that tends to turn into diminishing returns, so do your best to get a good sound quickly and get to recording. Our other option is the in-the-box solution using an amp simulator. An amp simulator is a piece of software or hardware that simulates the sound of a guitar going through an amp head, a cabinet, and a microphone. There are a lot of options on the market. Amplitube, Guitar Rig, Bias, Podfarm uh, are a lot of these software plugin options. And then on the hardware side, you have things like Line 6's Pod, uh, the, the new Helix looks really cool, and of course the Fractal Axe FX. The advantage amp simulation has over live amp recording, besides being a lot quieter, uh, is that there are just so many options. Every amp head, cabinet, and microphone you can think of has been simulated in one way or another. And by piecing these together in different ways, you can build any tone you can think of. And paging through presets of different tones can be a, a really great way to get inspiration when you're writing music. Also, if you're using a software plugin, you don't have to commit to a tone. You can record your guitar parts, 
And then, you know, a week later when you're mixing the track, you can change your mind about the amp you want to use. Switch out a Marshall for a, you know, a 5150. You can also do this with real amps. Uh, it's called reamping, but it's a little more complicated. We'll cover that in another video. Now, of course, just as with the mic placement thing, you can easily fall into the analysis paralysis trap. Uh, you know, you've got 500 different cabinet and amp combinations. Does this one sound just a little bit better than that one? Uh, and the same as with the mic placement, choose one, get on with recording. Like I said, you can always change it later. Now, a good amp simulator has a couple separate parts. There's the part that simulates the actual amp head and the part that simulates the cabinet, the speaker cabinet. Uh, and it's really important we have separate control over each of these because loading in our own custom cabinets is gonna be a huge part of shaping our sound. So you don't really hear this when recording a live amp because there's not a good way to do this in real life, but this is the sound of an amp simulator without a cabinet connected to it. That's how much of an effect your cabinet has on your tone. It takes this big mountain of fizzy noise and shapes it into an awesome metal guitar tone. So every major amp simulator I've used comes with a good collection of cabinets, uh, some built-in ones, and they all sound pretty good. But I'd like to be able to load in my own custom cabinets. Uh, if there's a really specific cab I love the sound of, I would love to be able to pull that in instead of whatever's built into guitar rig or bias. And we can do this with something called impulse responses, or IRs. Impulse responses are kind of recordings of like the raw tone of a cabinet. It records the effect it has on any sound you put through it, so you can later simulate that uh, anytime you want. Using software called an IR loader, uh, I personally like Kazrog's ReCabinet, we can pull these IRs in and apply them to our raw, fizzy guitar tone to build our final metal guitar sound. And from here on out, it's pretty much the same process as recording with a live amp. You put together a sound you like, you, you know, just as you place the mic, you choose your cabinet, and you get to recording. So tracking is the process of actually recording your guitars. And getting this step right is probably the most crucial part of making your guitars sound great. First off, I really recommend recording to a click track, in all musical contexts, but especially metal, where the tightness of the band is really essential to making the sound hit hard. Now, if you're not comfortable playing to a click track, I'd suggest working on that with a metronome right away. Layering your guitar recordings is a key element of getting a modern metal sound. At bare minimum, I will double track my rhythm parts, recording it twice, then panning one to the left and one to the right. For an even fuller sound, you can quad track, recording two guitar parts for each side of the stereo spectrum. But just know if you do that, you have to be right on the metronome, because if you're not, it is gonna be four times as obvious. As soon as you have multiple guitar parts involved, your arrangement becomes really important to making sure the mix doesn't get out of hand. I tend to build my guitar parts like a pyramid. Uh, if I have, say, a rhythm, a harmony, and a lead, I'll do four rhythm tracks, two harmony tracks, and maybe just one lead track on top. And uh, that helps have a nice solid foundation for that lead to sit on without it getting too top heavy if I were to do the other way around, you know, four leads and one rhythm part. On a related note, recording your song in pieces can really help keep things consistent. At the most, I'll record four to eight bars at a time of any guitar part, just to really make sure I can focus in on the details of that part and get everything just perfect before moving on to the next section. In most DAWs, you can even loop record a section. So select, say, the two hardest bars in that bridge and uh, loop over it six or seven times until you get things just perfect before moving on. 
So now that we have all our guitar parts in one place, recorded and ready to mix, we can go about making it fit in with the rest of the band, which can seem kind of challenging at first. Trying to get a nice, heavy, hard-hitting sound without overpowering the drums, bass, if you have vocals, those, uh, can be really tricky. So here's a few tips for getting the mix just right in a metal mix. So first up is to group up our tracks so we can process them all together. Every DAW handles this a little bit differently. Some call it a group track, an aux bus, or a submix. But the general idea is that for each instrument group, say uh, I have my rhythm guitars and my leads, I want to have just one channel I have to work with to affect every track in that group. So I want to have one rhythm guitar track and one lead guitar track. If I put an EQ on that rhythm guitar track, it affects every rhythm guitar I recorded. This helps keep our mix nice and cohesive and clean without having to update 10 different plugins every time we want to change something. So the first step in our mix is to stop the guitar and the bass from fighting over certain frequencies. The guitar is actually a really bassy instrument. The low E string on a six string guitar is tuned to around 82 hertz. And a seven string guitar in drop G can get down to 49 hertz. That's right in the bass's home territory and it is not gonna like that. Leaving those bass frequencies in, in the guitar while the bass is playing, is gonna give us a muddy, gross mix. So we're gonna use an EQ with a high pass filter, which is gonna cut out the low frequencies. Using a high pass filter, cut up to somewhere around 100 hertz. This is gonna depend on the kind of music you're playing, the guitar you're using, the amp or uh, simulator you're using, but you wanna find a nice sweet spot, somewhere between the muddy mess below and cutting out too much and leaving your guitars paper thin. Now on the other end, in the bass, you can make a slight EQ cut right where most of the guitar frequencies lie. This gets the bass and the guitar out of each other's way so we can comfortably start mixing without having to turn everything up and up and up until we just run out of headroom and the mix sounds terrible. The next step is to cut out the noise. So whenever we're recording guitar at this kind of gain level, we're gonna pick up a lot of noise from a few different sources. Electrical noise from the lights and just the wires in the walls. Uh, room noise from the, the actual room the amp is in if you're recording a live amp. And just the physical noise of your hand hitting the strings, you know, sliding on the frets. I personally prefer to go through the track manually, getting in there by hand and cutting out every little space between the music. Uh, this especially goes for like really syncopated, genty riffs, where all the heaviness comes from the space between those notes. Some DAWs can kind of do this automatically. Pro Tools has a feature called Strip Silence that'll detect spaces of silence in between signals and cut those out physically in the clip. And it works pretty well most of the time. You can also kind of accomplish this with a noise gate, uh, whether in a pedal form or a plug-in. Uh, some amp simulators have these built in. And these work by detecting when the signal goes below a certain level and shutting off the sound at that point. The only thing that makes me uneasy about that is I worry it's going to cut out a sound I wanted to come through and there's no going back from that, especially if you used it in a pedal when you were recording. So for that reason, I really like to manually cut up my tracks. Uh, it takes a little bit more time, but I find it's worth the effort. Finally, again, strive for rhythmic perfection. Don't be afraid to get in there and do a little bit of editing to tighten up a performance. If you hit the big downbeat of the chorus just a couple milliseconds early, just before the drummer did, uh, get in there with Pro Tools and nudge it a couple milliseconds forward, fix it up. Now, of course, if you find yourself cutting and nudging every single hit, you might want to spend a little bit more time with a metronome. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one posted every Sunday and live streams in the studio every Tuesday. If you had any questions about what I covered in this video or things you'd like to see me cover in the future, leave them in a comment below and I'll either get back to you in the comments or cover it in a future video. See you next time.